This was a unit which was uh, not supposed to go overseas. It was a unit which stayed here, and they, as, as they said in the military, cadre new units off of it. And if there were problem children, they always transferred them back to our unit before they went overseas. So when our time came to go overseas, it was kind of a special challenge. And I guess that's what human nature is all about. We had a special challenge. I think we wound up on top. Did you have the best unit of them all? No doubt about that. <laughs> The 325th Fighter Group was formed early in 1942 by the 15th Army Air Force. Flight training for its new recruits commenced immediately and was completed by early 1943. On January 19, 1943, Group Commander Gordon H. Austin successfully led all 72 pilots in their P-40 aircraft into the skies from the aircraft carrier USS Ranger to their first base in Africa. The fighter group, consisting of the 317th, 318th, and 319th fighter squadrons, steadily built a reputation as ferocious and determined fighters, both in combat and in bomber escort duties, exemplified by a run of 59 escort missions without a single loss from enemy aircraft attacks. When the 15th Army Air Force commanders allowed each fighter group to display their own unit markings, 
Bob Basler and John Watkins created the paint scheme that would distinguish the 325th from its compatriots. Soon after, the freshly painted yellow and black checkerboard pattern sat proudly on the tail and rudder of the group's P-40s and stayed with them until after the war's end. Over the following months, the 325th Fighter Group wrought havoc against the land and air forces of Axis-held territory. During one intense battle on their 103rd mission, fought in the skies between Oristano and Cagliari, the 317th Fighter Squadron decimated the Italian and German aircraft they encountered, downing 38 for the loss of only one of their own. That evening, Axis Sally, the voice of the Axis propaganda radio, announced that they would now be watching for the fighter boys of that old checker tail clan. The 325th fighter group had just been christened with a nickname that stays with them till this day. The checker tails continued to harass the enemy at every opportunity and became renowned by both the enemy they battled and the bombers they escorted as one of the most competent and dedicated in the 15th Air Force. Later, they were transferred to the Mediterranean Theater of Operations, having completed their mission in North Africa. Soon, the group was transitioned to the Republic P-47, a new aircraft with a far greater range of armament. Over the following months, the group carried on with its relentless attacks against enemy shipping, airfields, rolling stock, and power supplies, including essential fuel and oil depots. The group also continued with their bomber escort missions, supporting the 8th and 15th Air Force bomber crews, who daily faced enemy fighters and flak as they headed deep into enemy-held territory. The 15th Air Force headquarters awarded the group with two distinguished unit citations for their combat skills during aerial battles against what seemed impossible odds, turning these battles in their favor and returning victorious. After the devastating attack at Pearl Harbor, there was no shortage of young men ready to sign up to the United States Army Air Force. For the first overseas group commander, Gordon H. Austin, and a future group commander, Bob Basler, a recreational flight early on December 7, 1941, from their base in Pearl Harbor, soon baptized the two young pilots into the war. Gordon Austin recounts his memory of the day of infamy. And actually, I went over to another island in a uh, airplane we had use of, which was a, a really an old type bomber that I took four people with me. I had a couple of artillerymen that were friends, and some of my airmen, and my co-pilot, Bob Basler. And uh, we took off, and we flew over to the near nearby island. So we went over there, and we enjoyed ourselves. We were actually going to be hunt for deer. And we, for, for, first thing you know, we got this message. This is a this is a real McCoy and whatnot, but you, you got to believe it. And so I got the people together, and we started home. And but anyway, it seemed strange because it ran contrary to what the, the situation was announced before we left. As we came up towards the uh, that big mountain on the corner, we looked ahead, and pretty soon you see some smoke around there. And gosh, we kept on right over the city. And right there was Pearl, and just flames everywhere, you know. We couldn't believe it. And here we were flying along in this old bombardment point, and I just kept on going. The first thing I know, I was sitting in, in, this, in a sea of anti-aircraft fire. We got too close, and what was left of the Navy was shooting at us. So I got out of there in a hurry, called my local base for landing, and they cleared us to land, said we got live bombs and bomb craters on the field. The field is under attack but you're clear to land. We went to land and the, we, we, the attack had gone, but all the airplanes were, were burning, you know. The fuel tank behind the, the, uh, the seat and the, the fighters would apparently keep fire, catch fire and the airplane would go up. The way I felt was, how did we get in this situation? Here are all these fighters lined up at Wheeler on fire, destroyed. All, of this, all our squadrons were there. And I mean, how did we ever get in a situation where there was no external threat? That was definitely just the word, there's no external threat. The threat is some local population, sabotage. My first thought was, gee, how did that ever happen? 
Gerald B. Edwards, a pilot of the 317th, recalls his decision to join the fight against the enemy. Uh, the day that uh, Pearl Harbor occurred, I was, in a, I was pumping gas at a gas station, and a young army lieutenant came in, a yellow convertible, and in the middle of it, he, we heard the announcement about Pearl Harbor. And he said, take that hose out of there, I'm going to war. He said, no. well, if he went. So the next day I had a day off, so I went down and enlisted. And a friend of mine who was already been drafted uh, went with me. And when we got down to Whitehall Street, where the recruiting office was, I saw this sign pointing up, be an aviation cadet. So I headed upstairs. He said, that's not the right way. I said, that's my way. <laughs> and that's where it all started. I was six foot one tall and I weighed about 200 pounds and uh, I knew I was going to go into bombers which I thought, Jesus Christ, I don't want to be fine, I'll be 24, be 17. <laughs> so anyhow, I was student OD and as a student OD you had to wake people up the next morning. Well, I'm one of these, if I went to sleep, you could set a bomb off underneath my bed and I probably wouldn't wake up. But uh, anyhow, so I thought, well, Jesus, I'd better stay awake. So I'm sitting there in the orderly room, and the most interesting thing to read were regulations. And uh, believe me, they're anything but interesting. So I started reading the regulations and reading and reading and reading, and uh, there was a whole wall of them. And finally, I got the one that was on the uh, going to multi-engine, single-engine flying school, you know. And it uh, right up there it says you had to go to, if you were over six foot uh, tall and you weighed over 180 pounds, why well, you had to go to twin-engine flying school. It says, however, see note below, down below in the regulations, a little old square about yay big. It says, this may be wa wavered by the commanding general of the Southeast Training Command. So I'd taken typing in high school. So I sat down, I typed the letter through channels to the commanding general of the Southeast Training Command, requested a waiver. And I told him I was six foot one tall, weighed 200 pounds. So I didn't think anything about it. I took it down and sent it through my squadron commander and the whole nine yards. And so anyhow, about three weeks later, I hear over the loudspeaker, Aviation Cadet Beatty, report to the orderly room. And I thought, holy God, what have I done now? You know, so I go down there and the old major who was a squadron commander, he says, Cadet Beatty, I want to congratulate me. And he gave me my waiver to go to single engine flying school. Well, I about pooped my pants right there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got into single engine flying school. Once signed up to serve their country, mechanics learned the skills necessary for repairing aircraft to quickly return them to the front line. Pilots were put through intensive flight training, including aerobatics, attack and defensive maneuvers, as well as navigation, which alone could mean the difference between returning to base or spending the rest of the war in captivity. Training was intense for both pilots and crew, and successful completion was not a foregone conclusion. Trainees often worried that they would wash out because of mistakes made in training. 317th pilot Jack Sherburn talks about his experience as he tried to earn his wings. The instructor I had, uh, he, he was brutal. and. Uh, I'm sure he was correct in everything he was saying to me, which was mostly swear words. But uh, uh, in trying to teach me things like shondells and uh, loops, and I wasn't, he, he, I wasn't aggressive enough. Uh, and I really had trouble getting him right. And he, <laughs> he would, he'd take the stick and he'd make uh, the vicious turns in the cockpit, knocking my knees. He was so mad at me, and he, and he kept telling me, Sherburn, grow up. Uh, well, with that attitude, I said, I don't, I'm not going to make it. But uh, I did. I'm not quite sure how, but I didn't have any ground loops to my credit. But, uh, yeah, the PT-17 was kind of tricky to land. And it's a matter of confidence, uh, and I think that when they turn you turn the plane over to you to solo, uh, 
that was a confidence building thing too. He wasn't in the cockpit anymore swearing at me. So uh, we, I was going to make it right. I, that was the incentive, I think. The instructors were really brutal. I'm sure in Bridgeport, Connecticut, we had been uh, practicing uh, uh, circular landings. By that, I mean we would come over the tarmac and pull our plane nose straight up in the air and off to one side like the left. And up at the top of that loop, uh, we would pull back on the throttle and uh, let the engine slow down while we completed the loop uh, uh, with our landing being at the bottom of the loop. The problem was that once in a while the engine would cut out and mine cut out at the top of the loop when I pulled back on the throttle that way. Uh, I wasn't able to get to, to the tarmac. Uh, my landing gear uh, hit on the edge of the cliff before the tarmac started. The landing gear was thrown up into each wing and I went sliding down the tarmac uh, uh, on my belly. They thought that um, at that particular time that because of the accident I would want to get out of fighter planes and get into uh, bombers instead. Uh, when I found what uh, upper echelon or my superior officers were thinking of washing me out of the fighter uh, group I went to my superior officers. By this time, I had been shifted to Randolph Field in Long Island, New York. Uh, I had to fight my way through uh, numerous officers before they finally decided that maybe there was something to me after all. They had taken it for granted that I would be too afraid to fight fighters and it took a lot of convincing for them to be uh, have their minds changed they were going to uh, wash me out of the fighter uh, completely 319th crew chief ed doss describes his more unorthodox selection into the group when uh, when we were at hartford or rensselaer field in hartford Colonel Basler, well, he was a major at the time. He became our squadron commander. And everybody that in our little cadre that was left over, he took each one of us separately into a tent. And he asked, he says, sir, he says, soldier, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work on the line with the airplanes. Okay, you're a crew chief. That was it. <laughs> The, and he did that with, if somebody wanted to be a cook, okay, we'll be a cook. And that's how he separated everybody out just by himself, determined what to go. Once issued their orders, they were sent across the Atlantic to their final destination, the Mediterranean Theater of Operations. The journey was not without danger. This account by Jerry Edwards is a chilling example of the perils that all shipping faced. Then the day came when we had to go back to uh, Jacksonville and uh, get prepared for overseas, get our teeth filled if we needed it and all that stuff, and fill all the bags we had to take with us. And then we shipped up to Virginia. It was a classified base. No one was supposed to know about it. And then we, one day we were sh trained down to the ship's dock and, lo and we loaded on a ship. There were 5,000 people on board the uh, Empress of Scotland, which had originally been the Empress of Japan, and we headed out overseas. One night I was up being on the watch, I was in doing watch officer duty too, so I could slip out on the deck between the curtains and, and go out and enjoy the night. So I got up on the ends of the, on the at, at the end of the ship, and I looked down, and I'm watching the flying fish and the phosphorescence of the water 
It was very pleasant. And suddenly, I saw a bright light, kind of like a searchlight in the water. And what the hell is that, you know? And then it would disappear. And it would appear again, because we were rolling. So I finally realized it was coming out of the ship. And we're supposed to be blacked out. So I went up on the bridge, and I got this bridge officer. I said, take a look at that. And he said, holy Jesus. He went in, and he grabbed a forty-five or whatever what pistol it was. And he and I went down to about the fifth deck below on the starboard side. And we came upon a carpenter's locker that had a padlock on it, that big. So he, he said, go around the corner. I went around the corner. He shot the locker off. And he came back. And we went in. The em locker was empty, but and the room was empty, but the two portholes were wired open. And there was a giant light that big wired up right in front of the porthole. It was like a big rehearsal light in the theater. So he just smashed it with his pistol, and that left no light. A couple hours later, this was now about four in the morning, this one guy said, hey, look at the telephone pole in the water. And we went and looked, and gentlemen, there's a submarine right next to us pulling in his periscope and crash diving. We almost ran him over. He was the guy out there looking for that light. It had to be. So he couldn't catch us, because we are going 25 knots anyway. But he got his crash dive over with, and he had to just leave the serene scene. There's no question in my mind that that, that submarine was meant to intercept our ship. And he was out there looking for us. We ran him over because he couldn't see the light. It wasn't there. At the beginning of their tour of duty, P-40s of the fighter group took off from the USS Ranger and landed in Casablanca. Within days, the group moved to their first official air base in Tafarawi, Algeria, on the 28th of February, 1943. Steadily, as the Allied forces made progress in the campaign against the Axis, the Checkertail clan moved to a series of staging points across the deserts of Africa and deeper into the Mediterranean theater of operations, setting up new bases at Montesquieu, Souk el Khamis, Matur, and finally Suleiman. With Rommel's Africa Corps defeated, the commanders of the 15th Army Air Force designated Italy as the next location from which to launch their attacks. On the 11th of December, 1943, the 325th was transferred to its first base in Italy, near the town of Foggia. Over the next four months, it soon became apparent that the Foggia base was inadequate to the requirements of the group. The decision was made to move once more to a newer, larger, and more effective base at nearby Lake Lucina. The airfield was perfectly suited to fighter operations, and with a long downhill slope on the main runway, it was easy for the pilots to gather speed before lifting off, even when laden with their long-range fuel tanks. The station was ideal, with a large area to accommodate all three fighter squadrons, a mess hall, officers club, and even a church and cinema. The Lacina base was situated in a rich, unspoiled countryside, which made a relaxing change when the crews wanted to spend time to wind down after the intensity of their missions. The nearby lake was also a perfect location to enjoy swimming, sunbathing, or fishing. However, should any of the personnel take a train from the nearby station, the effects of war on the surrounding area soon became apparent. Many places had sustained damage that would take months, if not years, to rebuild. The newly arrived fighter group were welcomed by the locals, as the Allied crew's pay became invested into the local economy, easing the burden on a struggling community. It was at this base that the 325th became the first fighter group to gain the distinction of flying three different types of aircraft in active combat, as they transitioned from the popular P-47 into the P-51 Mustang. The P-51 Mustang was developed by North American Aviation for the Royal Air Force as a replacement for the P-40 Tomahawk, which had then become surpassed by Axis aircraft. Originally, the British had requested upgraded P-40s. The P-51 design was proposed because of the realization that adapting the Allison engine to the P-40 
and myriad other upgrades was so involved that they could just as easily start from scratch and have a completely new design based on the latest aerodynamic principles. A delicious irony in the Mustang's history is that it was the vision of Edgar Schmude, a German aircraft designer who, before coming to the United States, had worked for both Fokker and Messerschmitt, soon to be adversaries of his new creation. The groundbreaking laminar airfoil with its maximum thickness at 40% back from the leading edge allowed the use of two spars with spacing that was just right to accept the Browning machine gun. In looking for the most streamlined shape, Schmood consulted nature and followed the shape of the brook trout. From concept to first flight took a little over six months. It was soon adopted by the United States Army Air Force and the designers steadily made improvements, one being the pairing of the airframe with a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, possibly the most advanced engine design of its time. The early Mustangs were fitted with four 50 caliber machine guns, later increased to six. The addition of long-range fuel tanks enabled a Mustang to escort bombers all the way to the heart of Germany and back again. One famous quote of the time was, the P-51 can't do what the Spitfire does but it does it over Berlin. Further developments featured a variety of ordnance, which included rockets, fragmentation bombs, and napalm. The later addition of a bubble canopy greatly enhanced visibility, giving an almost 360 degree view for the pilot. With further changes, the Mustang became the fastest propeller-driven aircraft during World War II with a service ceiling and range far surpassing any other single-engine fighter in the world, and one of the most adept fighter aircraft of that period. By early 1944, many Allied fighter groups in Europe had taken delivery of the P-51, one of those being the 325th, based in Italy, who saw the new aircraft arrive steadily at their base from late April 1944. Members of the 325th Fighter Group described their first impressions of the P-51 when it arrived at their base. When I first saw the fir uh, first plane I was going to fly, I was amazed at the sleekness of the silhouette of this airplane and was thankful that the reputation that it held as the, the best plane that was in the European theater made me feel much more comfortable with the fact that I was going to fly a P-51. I think the, the most enjoyable part about flying P-51s was that it was an easy plane to fly. It trimmed easily. It handled wonderfully. You didn't have to manhandle the controls. It responded very easily. It had no drawbacks other than the fact that when we first took off, we had to be sure that we used our fuselage tank because the plane was unstable until we reduced the amount of gas that was left in the fuselage tank. Once that was done, then the plane handled beautifully. We uh, fighter command, uh, General Struthers, he he got us together and said, I'm going to give you a choice. He said, uh, you can fly P-38s or P-51s. You know, we were, I was in shock. What's this? I trained for something else. And so uh, I don't really know why I said P-51s, except it was more macho to fly with one engine than with two. two P-38 was for sissies. <laughs> I was glad to check out on the P-51, and the uh, first thing I did, I took it up and I firewalled it to see how fast it, it really was. Cause, you know, those things get exaggerated, like this is a 400 mile an hour fighter. I felt I had the best stuff, the best uh, equipment in the world, and uh, I think we all were pretty much gung ho, saying, this is a terrific airplane. 51 was a brand new airplane for everybody, and we had the old 
B's and C's with the greenhouse canopy and uh, I crawled in that Hummer and I can tell you why in the hell they uh, said you shouldn't be over six foot tall and not weigh over 180 pounds because it, it, was, it was like trying to put about 10 pounds of shit in an eight pound bag because uh, you know you just didn't fit too well in there. The 51 was a, a wonderful airplane. I mean, it was the best that we had in the Air, uh, Army Air, Corps, Air Force at that time. I wanted to try to get some kills, and uh, the 51 was, uh, yeah. you know, the airplane uh, going right then. And here I was. I had arrived. I mean, it was, uh, it was just, uh, the feeling was indescribable. I mean, you you thought, God, I'm going to be flying that thing. And that was the hottest airplane there was, believe me. It had a hell of a lot of idiosyncrasies about it. 40, 47 was like having a hotel suite, and the uh, 51 was like being locked in the bathroom, I mean, uh, in comparison to size, you know. And, uh, but in other words, it, uh, uh, what you could do with the airplane, why, I mean, it was uh, uh, like you've got a Ferrari and you're sitting there, you know, and you've got a Lincoln Continental and you're trying to do the same thing. It's just, you know, you can't do it. But the 51, I mean, it was, uh, you, you could sit there in that 51 and roll over and, I mean, you could, you could have it going just as fast as it would go in about 5,000 feet. And uh, it was just, just a wonderful airplane to handle, really. Well, the 51 was the nicest to work on because by that time it was very refined and very, I wouldn't say simple, but things seemed to be so well engineered when they manufactured it. It was just one great aircraft. When we first got them, they were the B model, which was the canopy with the with the flap type. Then we started to get the uh, D model with the blister canopy. We had what what we call factory representatives, were assigned to each group. They usually had one for the frame and one for the engine. And we, they were always finding out what problems we had so they could put the, back the information to the, to the factory. And uh, I know one, one of the problems they had between the, uh, the B model, A and B models, they, at the tail end, the original ones, under certain kind of stresses apparently, the tail would fall off. And so they made a, a, a device, a framework, from the tail, and it extended maybe that far up on the fuselage to give it strength and stability. Their first mission in P-51s, escorting B-17s to the marshalling yards of St. Charles and Le Blanchard, was uneventful. But plans were being laid, which would soon put the 325th to the test. At the Tehran conference in November 1943, the Allied leaders devised an audacious bombing strategy using B-17s of the 8th and 15th Air Forces stationed in the UK and Italy. Its code name, Operation Frantic. Art Fiedler, a P-51 ace with the 325th, summarizes the objective assigned to the checker tails. You know, the 8th Air Force and the 15th Air Force, we operated from Italy. The 8th Air Force operated from England. These are the two strategic air forces. The 9th and the 12th were tactical to support the people on the ground. Uh, there was a limit as to how far the 8th could fly with their bombers and, and escort. Uh, they could fly to Berlin, I believe, without any great difficulty. But beyond that, there's Poland and every and. Uh, uh, the Polish border and the Czechoslovakian border had a lot of oil producing factories. I understand they were using coal, it was synthetic oil, but they needed it for their uh, army and, and air force, of course. Uh, when we flew from the south, Berlin, when, when, where we were first located, Berlin was 750 miles from us. Um, that is really too far for a 51 to escort uh, as long as we're escorting bombers because we're covering a lot more than 750 miles as we do the racetrack pattern. Uh, I felt that uh, we could comfortably escort bombers 650 miles but not 
not much more and uh, be assured of getting back. So the idea of the frantic missions was that we could now take off and go to a target that was further than we normally could reach and instead of coming back all that distance go on the shorter distance to Russia land there perhaps fly a couple of missions there hitting these areas of Eastern Europe that neither the 15th nor the 8th could hit. In February of 1944 after several issues had finally been settled between the Americans and the Soviets, the United States Army Air Forces were given permission to land American fighters and bombers at bases in the Ukraine. Immediately, American personnel began establishing a headquarters at Poltava, near Kiev. By the end of April, the work was completed, ready for the air crews to arrive. In the initial phase of these missions, the bomber groups were based at Poltava and Mirgorod, while Piryatin was the home of the long-range fighter escort for which the newly arrived P-51 Mustangs were the ideal aircraft. It was essential that these missions stayed top secret. The intention was to shock the Nazi High Command with the realization that they were vulnerable to attack deep in their own territory. Just as importantly, the missions were to draw attention away from Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings set to commence on June 6th on the Western Front. To make sure the 8th Air Force was at full strength for the D-Day offensive, 15th Air Force fighters and bombers were chosen to lead the first shuttle missions, as they were known, into Soviet Russia. Lieutenant General Ira Aker was quoted as saying, I'll feel much safer now, I know the checker tails will be flying cover above our group. High praise indeed from one of the main instigators of the missions. On June 1st, ground crews of the 325th were transferred to bomber bases where they were to be transported aboard B-17s to the Russian bases. The following day, at 0200 hours, Chet Sluter recalled seeing all of the pilots' jaws drop as the drape was pulled back from the briefing map, showing a thick black line extending all the way across Europe, a distance of some 1,200 miles. The pilots of the 325th were then briefed by Lieutenant General Ira Aker and Major General Nathan Toyning. I do not have to impress you with the importance of this mission to the Russian base. I'm sure you are fully aware of this important event. I would like to mention one thing about which you must be very particular. That is your conduct while at these Russian bases. Be soldierly and neat at all times. The Russian is a fine soldier who appreciates results and one who does not understand big talk. I wish you the best of luck. Goodbye. Barry Davis, who took part in the first shuttle mission, recalls the events as the crews entered the briefing that day. We were told that we were going to be on a special mission. We didn't know exactly when it was. And uh, to pack our musette bag with a change of clothes. So the day before the mission, we were told that we'd be, be flying a mission the next day. And we found out when we went to operations or to the briefing room that it would be to the Ukraine. We didn't know the names of the uh, where the air bases are located, three air bases that we use there were strange to us. We'd never heard of them before. But when we got there, we, they had it all marked up. We're going to hit Trebekin and uh, Czechoslovakia in the uh, very eastern part of Czechoslovakia on the way. We were told which uh, bomb group, B-17 bomb group, that we would escort. Given the times and uh, our Group commander and our squadron commanders, they were given maps, and we were given uh, a little bit of American money to take with us in case we got shot down or we uh, went down with engine trouble. We'd have something that was negotiable anywhere in Europe. Leading the fighter squadrons that day under the group command of Chet Sluter would be Major Herschel Green of the 317th, Captain Roy Hogg for the 318th, and Captain Raymond Hartley Jr. leading the 319th. Then, at 0700 hours, Operation Frantic began. 
70 P-51s rose into the sky above Lake Lucina and headed for their rendezvous over the Adriatic Sea with 130 bombers from the 5th Bomber Wing comprised of the 2nd, 97th, 99th, and 483rd Bomber Groups. The mission then continued to the marshalling yards at Debrechen, Hungary, where, under heavy flak, the bombers hit their targets before setting course for their final leg to the new bases in the Ukraine. It was stressed that the P-51s must stay with the bombers for as long as possible, as the Luftwaffe could still have an opportunity to arrive and cause problems. However, if the P-51 stayed too long, they would deplete their fuel reserves before reaching the safety of Puriaten, and the mission would fail. There was no room for error. Fortunately, the Axis forces had been caught by surprise, and the bombers and fighters left the target without further battles to fight. Once they reached the bomber base in the Ukraine, the groups parted company, and Chet's looter led the 325th on a course for Piryatin. Although the weather had closed, Sluter was confident that they would find the base shortly. After dropping through a thick overcast, the search began, but as time dragged on with no sighting, concern rose among the pilots as cockpit warning lights began to appear, indicating they would soon be running on fumes. Jerry Edwards recalls his arrival at the base as the fuel dwindled away. Chet was Sluter led that mission, and he did a wonderful job because we couldn't figure out how he found the place. I mean, it was so hard to find. It was incredible. And we landed on this grass field, and it was pierced plank growing up through the grass growing up through it. And I swear, I don't know how, how Chet ever found that place. It was just, it was just out in the boonies. It was just out in the boonies. But he, he, he had good maps, I guess, or he had a good, you know, he was a good navigator, I guess. At Piryatin stood 64 of the initial 70 P-51s that had started out that day, six having to return early with various mechanical problems. It was a fairly, well, it was new, their base. It was a big area, plenty of room there. There were no real taxi strips in there because the land was so flat. And I don't know when it had been farmed because it was mostly grass over it. It was difficult since there were no taxi strips and just the PSP, pistol plank and uh, runway built there. Uh, it wasn't easy to see the, the field itself. At the time we landed, <coughs> our crew chiefs or our maintenance people one of, uh, flew as crew on the bombers going over, and so they hadn't gotten our field when we landed. <clears throat> it was the Russians that showed us, you know, where to park our airplanes and do all of that. Quite frankly, it was not very well organized. I mean, there's no welcoming committee or anything like that for us. There might have been for the uh, for Chet Sluter, the uh, group commander, but for all the rest of us, there's not much of a welcoming committee. We sort of had to find our own way around. They had uh, tents set up, and we know we weren't uh, intentionally segregated from them, separated. Uh, there was no pro no effort made to keep us apart at all on there. In fact, they assigned an enlisted man to uh, every one of our P-51s. When we left, they were going to have to take an examination on what they had learned about the P-51. So they were they were truly inquisitive about everything. They wouldn't know everything they could find out about the airplane. At the bases of Poltava and Mirgorod, most of the B-17s arrived safely, with the exception of the one piloted by 2nd Lieutenant Alfred Bond of the 97th Bomb Group, which was destroyed over the target. Not only was this loss felt by the 97th, but also by the 325th. Aboard that aircraft was Staff Sergeant Austin J. Cronin of the 319th Fighter Squadron, listed as missing in action. The Germans had drawn first blood against the checker tails. On the evening of June 3rd, Lieutenant General Ira Aker, after negotiations at much higher levels, was granted permission by Major General Alexia Permanov to carry out a further mission from the Ukrainian bases against the airfield at Galati in Romania. 
Unfortunately, the weather closed in for the next two days, delaying the mission until June 6th. During this wait, Aker felt his aircraft would be much better used by returning to Italy to help with the forthcoming assault on the Western Front. But a message from General Spatz ordered him to stay in Russia. This meant that Operation Overlord was set to go ahead, while Aker could only wait out the weather. The only thing I remember is Herky Green loaded his uh, B-4 bag with about six bottles of scotch. And when he and it was he delivered it, he took it to a bomber and then the bomber flew it to Russia. And then he went to the bomber field to look for his scotch and the guy went up in the plane and he got this B-4 bag he said, is this it? He says, yeah, they threw it right out and he lost all but one bottle. The guy threw the bottle threw the bag out on him. <laughs> he, was, he was not happy. Finally, on the 6th of June, pilots of the 325th took off from Periaton and at 0935 formed up with the 5th wing bombers and escorted them to Galati, a mission that at last baptized the Mustangs in combat. Defending the bombers against a wave of enemy aircraft, the reputation of the checker tails stood firm. Lieutenants Hoffman and Barkey and Captain Roy Hogg were all victorious in protracted dogfights that day. While Colonel Sluter was engaged in combat with a 190, his wingman Captain Hogg disrupted the attack of six more bandits who were all trying their best to get onto Sluter's tail. Two of those 190s were taken down by Hogg's guns. As the first U.S. fighter group to fly in Russia, they made the first U.S. victories over Soviet airspace, dispatching seven enemy fighters. However, it had not been easy, and one of these encounters nearly cost the life of future P-51 ace Barry Davis. When we flew to the Soviet Union, we were on the ground for about four days, and then we flew a mission to attack railroad yards in uh, Bulgaria. And that's when I got shot up on. And the way I got shot up is because I wasn't looking around quite as much as I should have. We got in a fight. My, uh, when we ended up, my flight leader and I would own it were together. We, we'd lost one man, one wing of our flight, one member, had turned around and gone back to the Ukraine with engine trouble. And that left three of us. Well, we couldn't find a third person. So uh, Wayne Lowry, he was my flight leader. He and I were flying side by side, heading back toward the Ukraine, toward our field at Mirgorod. He was on the left, I was on the right. My job to look out for him is his job to look out for me. But he saw a plane coming up from my right rear, which I didn't see, didn't know it was there, and thought it was Bob Bass, the third man in our flight, until he started shooting. And evidently, the first cannon shell that Booger shot hit the cockpit and exploded and knocked me out. And uh, I didn't know anything then. I don't know how long it was, anything else. Wayne broke into the uh, enemy airplane, shot it up so it bellied in. When I came to, my airplane was flying at 20,000 feet very nicely, right by itself. And I looked at it the right wing, and he just made uh, Swiss cheese out of the right wing, and the canopy was shot off. My shoes were frozen. I'd walked through the dew and gotten them wet going to the airplane that morning, so they were frozen. And uh, anyhow, it got me back to our uh, field in the Soviet Union. It never flew again, as far as I know. This rare archive footage shows Barry's P-51 as ground crews look over the damage, showing the rudder after it had been removed and also the missing canopy. Jerry Edwards' fortunes were nowhere near as deadly, but ultimately frustrating for him. Uh, when we were coming out of there the first time to that mission, I happened to look and I saw two JU-88s in formation. They were flying along, heading up into Russia. I said, I called Chet, I said, hey boys, I'm gonna get those two, and I peeled off after them. I got in behind him, and boy, I'm gonna get me two JU-88s. And just as I'm all ready to fire, 
a Mustang raises up in front of me and shoots him down. I was so mad, I, you know, I could have wiped him out. I could have shot him down myself. <laughs> well, years later, when we went to this uh, party with the Hungarian air veterans, there were a lot of others there, Russians and Romanians, and here were these Romanians, four, three or four colonels. And one of them said to me one night, he said, you know, I was flying across Russia one day with a formation of two J-88s, and one of you guys shot me down. He said, yeah, I saw him do it. <laughs> it was the only time it could have happened. After returning to base, the Checker Tales found that not all of their fellow pilots had been so lucky. Lieutenant Donald J. McDonald was surrounded by a swarm of enemy fighters before a series of strikes on his P-51 disabled his engine, forcing him to bail out. McDonald survived, but was soon captured and made a prisoner of war. John Gonda, another of the Checker Tail pilots who was made a prisoner of war on a previous mission, explains from his own experience what fate may befall an airman who's caught in enemy territory. When the next thing we knew, we looked out and there was these uh, soldiers coming down the, down the street looking for me because they, of course they saw me up in the air, they were shooting at me. They came to the house they made me a prisoner of war. Uh, one soldier had, had a rifle strapped to his shoulders, and so he marched me to this little village and took me up to the headquarters, and, and uh, they interrogated me. Uh, we were told not to give them uh, any, any information, just our name and, and uh, serial number. And uh, I didn't offer any. They didn't ask me any either. So I, I didn't give them any information, just my name and, and rank and serial number. From there, they put me on a, on a truck and then took me up into, the, like a, up into the mountains or so. And I stayed up there in a, uh, a local jail overnight all wet from coming, wading into the seashore, uh, into shore, and uh, after that, I just kept going. I went. Uh, they took me across Italy, over to the uh, other uh, side of Italy. From there, they did some more interrogation. Then they put me on a train, and I was up in Germany. Went through a couple. In term war interrogations, and finally ended up at Stone Lugger Three. The final days of the first American mission to Russia passed quickly, and pilots found their own ways to entertain themselves on the base. Barry Davis and Jerry Edwards, two of the last surviving members of that first shuttle mission, share more of their memories from their time at Periodon. That was pretty interesting because they had these big old Russian soldiers and they kind of rough uniforms there. And uh, they only had a few females at the dance. But these guys, they danced together. And uh, it looked kind of strange to us, you know, that they were, they were really masculine looking. And to see a couple of guys like that dancing together was kind of strange to us. But evidently that's, uh, they, we were told anyhow that that's perfectly normal over there. Just like as, uh, when the men are in scarce supply, you see the girls in this country dancing together. Well, they, the men dance together over there. Oh, they had that thing, I don't know what they call the dance, where they squat down on the heels and then kick the legs. Some of the guys that demonstrated that to us, and it does not look like an easy dance to do. They were very proud if they were skilled at it, if they were good. And boy, they'd really get a lot of applause and all when they'd uh, demonstrate it for us. And one night we had a party, we were drinking Russian uh, potato vodka. And uh, you had, what you had to do was gargle the mouthful of potato vodka while they, they all sang the chorus of some famous song. And then you could swallow it and burn your throat out, it was terrible. <laughs> 
I didn't put up with too much of that. <laughs> On the 11th of June, most of the 325th departed their base in Russia for the final time. Unfortunately for First Lieutenant Lawrence Dubois, his aircraft suffered engine failure on takeoff and careened off the end of the runway into a nearby field. Although Dubois was unhurt, his Mustang was not so lucky and became a source for spare parts for future shuttle missions. For Barry Davis, the attack on his P-51 during the first mission out of Periodon meant he was now without an aircraft. He explains what happened next. Well, how am I going to get back to Italy? No problem. You're going back as the uh, side gunner on a B-17. Man, that scared me to death because to me those B-17s were like coffins. I mean, they, people got killed in those things. And uh, however, they flew me. Here came a Soviet C-47 old uh, transport with a single machine gun up at the top of it. They loaded me on that thing, flew me 75 miles over to the bomber base, and uh, they welcomed me. I was going to be an extra gunner for them on the thing. And uh, I had eaten, gone to bed that night, along about 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody pushed my shoulder, woke me up. Lieutenant? Yep. One of the fighter pilots got sick, and they want you to fly his airplane back. Man, I was out of bed so quick you couldn't see me. I'm going home. So they loaded me up on a, put my clothes on, they loaded me up on a two and a half ton truck and trucked me the 75 miles back to the fighter base. I got there just in time for the morning briefing and flew a P-51 back instead of being a gunner on that B-17. But that, just the thought of flying as a gunner on a B-17, I didn't have any clothes like they wear. All those wall wool line things and all that. I didn't have that. And just the thought of flying on the thing, though, nearly petrified me. I was scared. To make the most of their return flight, the rest of the clan were tasked with escorting the B-17s, leaving the airfields of Mirgorod and Poltava, for an attack against the airbase at Foxani in Romania. During their escort, a small contingent of the enemy arrived to try their luck at the bombers. After a few brief skirmishes, three more ME-109s were added to the victory count for the Checker Tails as they returned to Lucina. The 325th now had the distinction of being the first U.S. fighter group sanctioned to fly in Soviet Russia, and Barry Davis being the first U.S. airman to receive a Purple Heart in the very same skies. Following the successful landings by Allied forces on June 6th during the D-Day invasion, all available resources were directed to help in continuing the momentum gained by the Allied offensive. Southern France was the next destination for the 325th pilots, with Mustangs of the 318th and 319th hugging the contours of the land as they approached their targets in the vicinity of Nice on June 15th. On arrival, they saw that the area had already taken a severe beating, but rather than see their mission go to waste, the squadron split up to look for targets of opportunity. Lieutenant Hiawatha Mohawk became involved in a low-level fight with an ME-109. Racing low over the fields and hedges, Mohawk maneuvered into a position to bring his guns to bear on the enemy plane and downed it. Mohawk then looked over the landscape below and picked out a Ju-87 on the runway of a nearby airfield. Diving down, he exploded the aircraft to the burst of his guns. Other pilots, seeing Mohawk attack the base, followed him in and took their chance to strafe the hangars and buildings, adding several more enemy aircraft to the list of planes destroyed that day. 319th, however, suffered badly on the return flight, with seven pilots being lost. Initial reports listed William M. Lott as missing in action after it was thought his aircraft had crashed into the sea. This, however, turned out not to be the case, and the veteran of the 319th returned to base shortly after, much to the relief of his fellow airmen. Losses were always hard to take for the young men of the 325th, as the pilots and crews often became good friends. I think we'd been on a on a uh, 
escort mission and we were strafing, strafing coming back and Bob Merrifield was flying uh, with me and uh, he got hit and uh, he was losing fuel and we were coming across the Adriatic and uh, he said he wasn't going to make it so uh, I think it was either the day before or Christmas Day and anyhow he bailed out and you know I circled Bob Merrifield for God I don't know it seemed to me like it was hours it was probably somewhere around 30 to 40 minutes when they came out from uh, uh, I think it was Leghorn. The British had uh, some uh, ships up in there and they came out and picked him up out of the water. And uh, Bob always thanked me because, you know, I did circle him and, and uh, uh, made sure that they'd picked him up before I came back. And I just barely made it in myself. In fact, I ran out of fuel when I uh, landed on the runway. And, uh, but, it, you know, people think that's something heroic but it's not heroic I mean in other words uh, to me he was he was part of a flight and it was my responsibility to try to provide as much assistance to him as I could and that's the way I looked at it and, uh, and I've seen Bob oh, many times over my lifetime and every time he always uh, expressed his appreciation for what I did. My best friend at that time uh, whose name was Keith Bryant, uh, was the leader of his four planes right be ahead of my four planes. I was the leader of my four planes. Uh, because I was following uh, Keith's flight, uh, it was very easy for me to see when he literally blew up in front of me from ground fire. A month, maybe two months later, I received a letter from Keith's mother asking me to return a letter to her telling her all the details of how her son died. She apparently had been told that uh, uh, I was his best friend. I decided not to answer that letter, knowing that the more details that she would hear about his being blown up, uh, the longer it would take her to uh, relax about the fact of losing her son. I often thought that I would love to go to Cincinnati, find her, and talk with her about her sons and my relationship. Never happened to do that. I think the hardest letter I ever wrote was to Bill Murphy's uh, wife, because while I was on the Isle of Capri enjoying myself, he was still flying on a mission, and that's when he went down. He, when I got back, uh, he was missing at the end of the mission, and nobody knew what had happened to him. So we didn't know whether he was dead or whether it was uh, POW or just what had happened to him. And just to uh, write a letter to his wife was probably as tough a thing as I have ever tried to do. That was my first one that I wrote that way that I had to write. And he was not in my flight, but he was my best buddy. And another guy uh, flew into a tower and he hit, the, he hit the ground and he crashed. Harry Eiley, his name was. He loved to strafe Harry did. But he didn't survive that one. Well, one way I coped with it was when I finally, when I was, I finally got my own little house built I had the engineers build a house with belly tank boxes and a brick floor and I moved in with a tech rep so I didn't lose any more tent mates. So I can't I think I kinda of coped that way. I didn't have anybody I was in the tent with me that wasn't gonna be there that night. That happened a lot of times. But all all of the losses that I can think of in the case of Dowett and Bobo Fisher 
doubt was in my flight. I can't remember. I guess Bobo was too. Both of them were killed because they went into a cloud in formation and the planes went into a spin or steep dive and Bobo bailed out and then hit the infinite and broke his neck. And I had, a, I was, particularly with him, I had a, a real hard time. It, it was such a useless death. And Dowett never got out. He went into Lake Lucina. And uh, I was there when they, the fishermen went out and they actually pulled him out of the cockpit somehow. And they brought him back still with his parachute on. He was lying in the bottom of the fishing. But uh, <coughs> I was the only one there with the, uh, the fishermen and the fishermen, <laughs> their wives, and they all started crying. In the days following Operation Overlord, orders followed from the 15th Air Force headquarters that all possible units were to concentrate their firepower on the enemy's oil supply lines to starve the Axis forces of vital supplies they needed to counter the ongoing D-Day offensive. Austria and Romania were soon to feel the brunt of the initial attacks. During these missions, the 325th added more victories to their ever-increasing tally the most notable of which came to Major Herschel Green on the 23rd of June as he tangled with and downed Messerschmitt 109, bringing him his 15th victory. Shortly after, during an early morning fighter sweep on the 28th of June, the 325th's pilots had their hands full. When arriving at the target, they were met by a swarm of enemy fighters. The Axis pilots had obviously been warned of the incoming attack by outlying observation posts and had managed to scramble a variety of aircraft, including 109s, to intercept the inbound P-51s. The 325th pilots, on seeing the sky full of enemy aircraft, didn't miss a beat, and echelons made of four Mustangs each broke away from each squadron to challenge the enemy. It had been a long time since the Checker Tails had faced such a large group of fighters, and they relished the challenge. The sky came alive with the crackling sound of gunfire and the roar of engines as Axis and Allied pilots struggled for supremacy. As the last of the shell casings tumbled to earth, the Checker Tails regrouped and counted their number. To their relief, every pilot was accounted for, and the Mustangs turned for home. Below them lay the wreckage of 17 enemy aircraft, with many more listed as probable. Scoring victories that day along with other pilots were Lieutenants Barry Davis and Arthur C. Fiedler Jr., both of the 317th. The unique victory Arthur Fiedler scored is still talked about by veterans to this day. I got a lot of good hits on that wingman, and I, I want to tell you that he had an instantaneous reaction as my bullets were hitting him. He suddenly flipped that airplane over vertically and went down into a dive. And he smashed right into the ground and a great big column of oil smoke comes up. So this time I decide I'm going to take a picture, a, a movie picture with my gun camera film. I turn the guns off, I come down, uh, I take the pictures without the guns going off, of course. I start to pull up like that, and at about 1,500 feet, I couldn't believe it, a 109 came flying right in front of me. I immediately turned the guns on, went into a vertical bank to the left, opened fire, got uh, a half a dozen hits along the left side, and now my guns jammed. And so I suddenly found myself flying right into formation with this German 109. Where ab I'm about 40, 45 feet away from him. Uh, I'm looking at him and he's looking at me. I didn't notice a thing 
on that airplane. I didn't see a black cross, I didn't see a number, but I can tell you exactly what his helmet and what his uh, oxygen mask looked like. And I'm sure he could tell you what mine looked like because we were looking at one another. I'm trying to figure out what I can do. Can I dive? I can turn? I can do this? But anything I do, he's going to get a shot at me with his 20 millimeter cannon. And I have an aversion to 20 millimeter cannons. They make big holes and I didn't want to be the recipient of that. So I, the only thing I can figure out is if I take my 45 out and I start shooting at him, nobody likes to be sitting still 40, 45 feet away from a guy while he's shooting at you. I'm hoping that he's going to peel off to the right and I'm going to peel off to the left and go as fast as I can go to go home. Well, I reach up to pull my 45 out of my shoulder holster and as I start to pull it out, I'm astounded. His canopy comes off and he bails out. Well, I uh, went down and took pictures of him in his parachute uh, with my gun camera uh, also. And when I got home, I reported what had happened. And uh, suddenly I found myself with the uh, nickname Svengali, the master hypnotist. You know, they're saying that I hypnotized the German into bailing out. Of course, it's a big joke and everything. Uh, the long and the short is I didn't hypnotize anybody else into bailing out. <laughs> the long and the short is that uh, you had to shoot them down. Barry Davis confirms the gun jamming issue and the unorthodox suggestion to fix it made by his ground crew. About once every two weeks we'd have, I guess you'd call it hang a fly in a session of all the pilots in the mess hall and uh, just talk about things like uh, on the B's and C model P-51s, the machine guns would jam if you went on a tight turn and tried to shoot them. And uh, we talked about what to do about that, how to, how to avoid that happening. The only thing they could figure was with, at the time till they got a little electric motor to boost it along, the only thing to figure was not make tight turns. The, engineering officer, who's the maintenance officer, responsible for all the airplanes, he told us we had to keep those machine guns lubricated. Lubricated? How are we going to do it? So said, well, you have to piss on them. We looked at each other, how in the world at 25,000 feet are you going to climb out on that wing and uh, piss on a machine gun? Missions steadily increased over the next few days, taking the checker tails into enemy territory for a variety of sorties, fighter sweeps and high altitude bomber escort making up the bulk of their work. On July 26th, Checker Tails escorted B-24s making their way to the target area of Zulfoxing. What seemed like another routine mission changed abruptly. Breaking through the radio silence came a distress call from crews aboard B-17s of the 301st Bombardment Group as they headed for their target at the engine assembly plant at Wiener Neudorf, Austria. The 332nd Fighter Group, known as the Tuskegee Airmen, had failed to rendezvous with the bombers, and now fighters of the Luftwaffe were massing as they prepared to attack the heavies 60 miles south of Vienna. Lieutenant Wayne Lowry took his echelon of four fighters and was joined by Lieutenant Arthur Fiedler as they raced toward the B-17s to intercept the attackers. As they approached the area of the distress call, Fiedler spotted a formidable group of enemy fighters packed together in a configuration eight across by eight deep, a total of 64 Messerschmitt 109s and Folkwolf 190s, all preparing to attack the bombers. As Fiedler called out the fighters to Lowry, the Luftwaffe began to fire at the B-17s. One instantly exploded and others suffered critical damage as hundreds of bullets and cannon shells found their mark. Fiedler swung into action and dove into the huge formation of enemy fighters, hoping to disrupt the front line and break up the formation. Lowry saw Fiedler's plane diving into the pack and radioed his fighters to join in the battle. Holy crap, there's a lot of people coming here. 
As the battle raged, Art Fiedler, whose initial attack had broken the attacker's formation, was dragged down into a low-level battle in the Alpine Valleys, not realizing that as he prepared to attack his quarry, he himself was a hunted man. And I'm now drawing into firing range. I'm about 300 yards away from him. Well, just as I'm about to open fire, I take and I look around and here comes a fox wolf, not more than 100 yards away from me, and he's closing in. Um, I don't know why he didn't open fire at that time, but I guess he was going to get really close and make sure. But uh, as soon as I spotted him, I immediately uh, pulled off to the left, did a roll, and chopped my power, and he went by me. When I finished my roll and I came uh, back into level flight, there's this fox wolf ahead of me, and we're doing well over 400 miles an hour, and we have entered a canyon, and it's a narrow canyon, and I think that he's probably going to do a vertical maneuver to try to uh, shake me, uh, but he surprised me. He suddenly went into a steep vertical bank to the right. I put my pipper out in front of him, uh, brought it back, and uh, uh, hosed him down. Uh, he ended up doing a snap roll to the right, and then he went right into the side of the canyon. To go down this canyon with power, full power on, and the canyon turned left, and suddenly it comes out into a um, uh, a wide area that's relatively flat with a uh, small hill in the center of it. And I'm looking for this other fox wolf because I know he's ahead of me. And all of a sudden, over the top of this hill comes an airplane right at me. I know this is a fox wolf. And I get all ready to open fire on him. We're making a head-on path. And I hear this voice say, if that's a P-51 coming towards me, waggle your wing. Well, I waggled my wings. And it was Lowry, one of our uh, top aces. Anyway, we, I joined him, we climbed up, we were up about 11,000 feet, uh, and all of a sudden Lowry goes down into a steep dive to the left, and I look down, and there's a trail of black smoke that as far as I can see from the right goes right, right down below us, and right at the head of it is a ME-109. Uh, this man was not wounded, he was using his uh, 
M M uh, W fifty, which is a fifty fifty mixture of methyl and water, to allow him to draw more power with his engine. Lowry dives down, and of course I'm right behind him. Uh, Lowry gets up there at firing range, opens fire, and his guns go. Bruh! And it turned out that he fired uh, perhaps three rounds out of e three rounds out of each gun, and he was not uh, out of ammunition. He had just been in a fight when he came over that hill, and he had used almost all his ammunition. So uh, Lowry pulls off to the side, and he says, "He's all yours, you lucky sob." And so uh, I pulled up behind him, and I, I'm drawing up very close to 250 yards because that's the, the 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 distance our guns were synchronized at. And Lowry is is sitting up there, and he's he's shouting, "Shoot! Shoot! Shoot!" And I'm saying, "Hold your horses! Hold your horses!" Anyway, I open fire at uh, 250 yards. There was one hit that I saw right behind the cockpit. The one hit and there's an immediate explosion. And Lowry is up there yelling, shoot again, shoot again. So I open fire again and this time there's a huge explosion. And uh, that was the fifth victory that made me an ace. That was the 26th of July, 1943. As Fiedler was becoming an ace, so was Captain Richard Duncan, who secured a victory over a 190 before latching onto a retreating 109. After a brief tussle for position, the enemy pilot soon bailed out from his severely damaged aircraft. That victory made Duncan the second ace during that day's mission. Eight other pilots destroyed an enemy plane each, completing a superb show of superiority by the checker tails while dealing with overwhelming odds. Jack Kinney, who also took part in that day's mission, describes how he found himself low on the deck chasing a Folk Wolf 190 that was lining up a shot on his friend's Mustang. We went from uh, about 20,000 feet or so down to a very low, we call it treetop level. I don't know to this day why the uh, German pilot held off on his firing because he was close enough to the American plane to, to have hit it, but he still kept pushing to try to get closer. Possibly he thought he was uh, in a position where he would close completely on the uh, American plane. I don't know what, what prompted him to hold off his firing uh, as long as he did. But I'm glad he did. He got, uh, little, uh, got an angle on the, on the turn and uh, Closed in on a, on a deflection shot, where you it's just like shooting pheasants, and you, know, you, you lead them out, and uh, hopefully it's the right lead, and you get a good result. The next few days were protracted missions with 325th pilots escorting B-24s and B-17s deep into enemy territory. Each brought further victories for the Checker Tail clan. On July 31st, at 26,000 feet, an estimated 44 enemy planes were encountered as the 325th escorted B-24s to the Mogasoya oil refineries. After turning into the attackers, each side maneuvered for tactical advantage at a cost of altitude, eventually leading to a battle for supremacy skimming over the deck. The Axis pilots scattered, and the pilots of the Checker Tail clan set about their work. Lieutenant Harry Parker led the way with his guns destroying four ME-109s. Lieutenants Phil Sangermano and Ben Emmert were close behind with three 109s each. These victories were enough to gain all three pilots the rank of ace. They had a allotment of an ounce of liquor after every mission. And the flight surgeon was the one whose job it was to dole it out. So he'd pour it over his own objections. He didn't think it was necessary or anything else. He, he really was against that thing of having a shot of liquor when you get down, get back from a mission. And... Uh, 
We had one P-51 that we declared was uncombat worthy. It got tangled up in thunder clouds and it wrinkled the wings. And for some reason, it was out of kilter. They couldn't get it straightened out so it would fly. I test flew it. And every time I get upside down, it would roll out into an Emmelman. It wouldn't fly upside down for some reason. But anyhow, we declared it uncombat worthy. And I think we had the first P-51 with two seats in it because we took the 85-gallon fuel tank from behind the pilot seat and put another seat back there. No controls, but a seat. And we used it strictly for administrative flights. Took all the machine guns out of it, all the armor plate, and that thing was fast with all that weight taken off it. It could move. Well, the uh, flight surgeon had wanted to go on a mission. He just really wanted to do that. Well, there was one mission that was supposed to be a milk run. And, uh, okay, a doc, you can climb in the back seat, and we'll fly this plane along. No machine guns, no protection on the thing, no armor plate, anything else. But they were flying along because it was supposed to be a milk run, no opposition at all. Well, the Germans double-crossed us. They had all sorts of measures meant to come in at the group. I wasn't on the mission, but I was... When they came back and landed, the uh, P-51 with his second seat in it and the flight surgeon, the doctor, it came in first mm -hmm. because it came, broke away as soon as it could. Man, as soon as that doctor got on the ground and got back over to our mess hall where we all went after the mission, he got himself a drink of liquor. <laughs> it, made, it converted him no end there. He never had a word to say about our drinking them then on. On the 14th of August, the 325th briefly moved to Tarquina Airfield in order to turn its attention to attacking heavy gun positions in southern France to soften up the area for Operation Dragoon. The principal objectives of Operation Dragoon were establishment of a bridgehead by airborne troops and the landing of the 36th U.S. Infantry Division on the beaches of Cavalier, Saint-Maxime, and Saint-Raphael. The 325th severely damaged the heavy guns, as well as the surrounding area. The action was decisive in aiding the success of the Allied invasion on August 15th. On the 16th of August, the Chequertails returned to Lucina. Over the following three days, their missions were to escort B-24s to bomb the synthetic oil refineries at Palesti. All passed without incident. Not one enemy fighter came to attack the bombers. Once again, it seemed the Luftwaffe were reluctant to go head-to-head -head with the 325th. Even though the Chequertails faced no opposition, it was always essential that ground crews make sure their aircraft were ready for the next mission. Ed Doss, a crew chief with the 319th, explains his responsibilities once the P-51s returned to base. We were assigned an airplane, and you did all the maintenance on it. You had to, you had to do all the pre-flighting and anything that had to be done, uh, putting on wing tanks and pre-flighting and changing spark plugs or whatever. If there's a mechanical problem, you did it. If it was within your realm, you could do it. And then if, there, if it was a more major repair or operation, we had, there's an engineering section in the squadron. So they would send a couple of the engineering guys over there to help do what we had to do. But as the crew chief, you had the job of just make sure the darn thing was airworthy. The process was that when, a, when the pilot came in to the aircraft to fly it, he had a sign off on it. And on the, on the sheet, there was two boxes. One said, nope, no problem, so you never checked it. The other box, you put an X in it just to make him sign the form. It meant nothing. It meant some, some uh, technical order that was totally insignificant. The plane could fly for a thousand years and it wouldn't matter, but you made him sign, put a little technical flaw on there, so he was signed to, to, the release to go on the mission. And then when he would come back from the mission, he would have to, he would, we would converse with him and ask him, you know, what, did he have any problems? Or, and he said, oh, it, did, it ran rough or 
something radio didn't work too good, they reported back to us and then if it was a radio, we'd have to go up to the radio shack and get the people down there to check the radio. And then in the meantime, we'd pull the cowling off, check for oil leaks, fill it up with fuel and maintenance, put oxygen in them, check all the fuel levels, the oil level, and and do all the, check the tires, check the struts. You did, you had to make sure that there were certain things you had to do, and they had to come to, come to a standard. Jack Sherburn fondly shares his thoughts regarding his ground crew. Never thought about it for a second that it was anything except complete expertise on their part. And nothing ever happened to, that, to me in that airplane. And there had been a few problems, but they're mainly caused by me, not by the, by the crew chief. Hey, hey, they're, they're, if anybody says they flew, all those missions and, and never had a mishap or didn't do anything stupid, uh, they'll lie. The only problem I had was my own stupidity in the cockpit. But they, Stanley Seek was my crew chief and I just thought he was wonderful. Not all of the missions flown by the pilots of the Checker Tail Clan involved escorting bombers or dogfighting with the enemy fighters. One particular mission flown by Wayne Lowry is recalled by Barry Davis, which saw a Folk Wolf 190 brought right into the heart of the base at Lucina. I don't know how we got it, but our operations officer, Wayne Lowry, who was my flight leader one time, he went over here and got to be operations officer. He was a uh, second highest scoring pilot and uh, I was high scoring as a squadron commander, but they had Wayne to go get the uh, Funk Wolf. So he comes flying in there, he doesn't get a whole lot of check out, but he comes flying in. Boy, everybody, here comes out Funk Wolf 190. Well, it has a electrically operated landing gear that retracts it and extends it. And just one button, like a toggle button, you push it, the gear goes down. That's an indication that the gear is down, but Wayne doesn't know where that is. And uh, you push it again, the gear comes up. So here he comes in, flies the landing pattern. Everybody's standing out watching him in this Fort Wolf 190 that we're going to have. And he pushes a button and the gear goes down, which is fine. But to make sure it's down, he pushes a button a second time. And the gear goes back up again. The tower season coming in with the gear retracted, boy, they start shooting off flares like crazy, red flares. He thinks, man, this is a great welcome, just like the 4th of July. Brings in and makes a beautiful belly landing. It just bends the propeller up. That's all, all the damage it does is such a nice landing. But he is uh, totally embarrassed, of course. And uh, the most amazing thing, they were scared to use the engine then because that propeller got bent up. It probably did something to the push rods and all in the uh, engine. They found another engine somewhere, and the American mechanics using American tools, the uh, Falk Wolf, all that stuff, of course, is uh, metric. But using American tools, so we didn't have any metric tools there, they changed that engine in just a little over an hour. And it's an all-day job on a P-51 to change the engine. But if they had it, they have couplets that you just screw together. That's your airspeed indicator, that's your oil, that's every, you know, everything in just one coupling there. It's a beautifully engineered thing. Even though Lowry was a very experienced pilot, the years of training and fighting didn't ensure that a simple mistake couldn't be made. New pilots arriving at the base were naturally concerned not to make mistakes that could jeopardize their lives or their future careers. Frank Bullock remembers his first mission. During the first mission, you just want to make sure you don't goof up. You're, you're just busy trying to stay in line, stay in position, not do anything stupid. Plus, your head's on a swivel and you're, you're looking for enemy aircraft. You learned as you went along because it's amazing how little you see on your first half a dozen missions. 
you don't, you don't realize what's going on because everything seems to be happening very quickly. Thinking back on my first mission, I, I do recall the length of time that you get through the cloud cover, uh, joining up with the bombers, and we had to make sure that they were safe. And then just sitting and weaving for five, six hours, I started to wiggle and keep trying to adjust my position in my seat because my butt was beginning to ache. And after flying a half a dozen missions to seven missions, I couldn't sit down anymore. My butt was so sore. It took a while to get used to uh, the longer missions. Barry Davis, flying a typical mission in late 1944, was by that time considered a veteran of the group. But for Davis's wingman, Frank Mertley, who was taking part in his first mission, the experience still remains etched in his memory. I was flying uh, Barry Davis's wing as a number two guy. Uh, we went to a place called Blackhammer, which was up on the Polish border, escorting the B-17s. They were doing, uh, I guess there was an oil, oil refinery there. And we ran into uh, a fight, uh, it was my first, and uh, I'll never forget it. I heard people calling bogeys, and I couldn't see any. I wouldn't, didn't know how to do that yet very well. And uh, finally, I saw that Barry was chasing a guy, and I went after him, and I said, Barry dropped his wing tanks, and I dropped my wing tanks, but I forgot to switch fuel, so my engine quit, <laughs> and I realized what happened and turned it back on. He poured on full throttle and chased Barry and caught up to him and stayed behind him. And then I saw smoke coming off his wings and I says, oh my God, somebody's shooting Barry. And I said, so I had backed off a little bit, started looking around, started doing what I was supposed to do. And I realized he was firing his guns. So Barry shot the guy down. We followed him down, uh, I don't know how far down. And I, I uh, went with him on his wing and uh, Pull, we pulled back up in the air, I don't know how, probably 15,000 or so, and uh, went on home. And uh, when I got there, Barry says, you're the first guy that's ever stayed with me in a fight. And I didn't admit to him that I was just lucky. <laughs> but uh, a very vivid uh, experience. Uh, but I guess in uh, during on that mission, I think we shot down about six or seven airplanes. Uh, Barry got one. Uh, Guy by the name of Duncan got another one. I don't know who the rest of the guys were. So that was uh, quite an experience. I learned a lot. On August 21st, the Checker Tail Clan set out on a mission to Haidu Bazormany Airfield, and on arrival, methodically set about shooting up the parked aircraft. To the surprise of the pilots, there was only a random burst of flak and no other opposition. The pilots made the most of this lack of suppression and left an unprecedented scene of carnage. Lying scattered on the runway behind them as they left were the remains of 37 destroyed aircraft and at least another 30 severely damaged. The next mission was not as easy, but it still made an ace of another of the Checker Tail clan. Lieutenant Barry Davis and other 317th pilots were escorting B-24s back from a successful bombing mission against the Odertal oil refinery on the 17th of August. Suddenly, a group of 109s and 190s attacked the pack of retreating bombers, and the checker tails went into action. Barry Davis got in tight on a 109, and with a burst of his guns, burst it into flames. Looking around, he saw another enemy aircraft, this time a 190, trying to line up a shot against one of the B-24s. Swooping in, he scored multiple hits across the fuselage. The pilot soon struggled free and disappeared through the low cloud base, followed shortly by his stricken aircraft. Barry became an ace that day with his fifth and sixth victories. Arriving back at the base, the group would often need to wind down and relax. Sometimes there was a need for a volunteer to make a quick flight, which Art Fiedler recalls was probably considered one of the more important missions, in the opinion of the pilots. Um, our beer came in uh, glass bottles, 
and we had no temperature control, there was no place to put the beer to cool it. So what we would do is we would put the beer in the drop tanks of a P-51 and, uh, you know, try to put some kind of cushion material, maybe cardboard or something like that. The, the man would take off, climb up to 30,000 feet, come back down, and the beer would really be nice and cold. Uh, when the airplane came down, the enlisted men would be lining the runway, and if he made a good landing, everybody cheered and clapped. Uh, if he made a bad landing, uh, there was a lot of anxiety, and I have to tell you that uh, more than once, uh, uh, more than a few bottles of beer didn't quite make it, but it was the only way we could get the beer uh, quickly chilled. Pilots and crews were afforded time for rest and relaxation, Often this would see men heading off the base into local towns to sample the local culture. 317th Crew Chief Jack Evans talks about one of his excursions off the base where he visited a local church and was surprised by who he met. We uh, travel in Italy and, uh, <coughs> and hit a hole string of priests and the Pope was there and I walked up on steps and shook hands and the Pope spoke with the Pope. I, I remember it very clear like walking up the, oh there were, there were more men in the group and that I was in, but I, I took my turn because there were other guys did it, but, uh, but I did, I did, I, <coughs> the Pope spent some time on a, the, uh, <coughs> on the porch, if you can call it, Concrete porch. He, he was out there visiting, and and uh, I I don't know exactly how I got in there, but it was really something. That, see, my hand is still marked. <laughs> he says, "Be careful, you go to hell." <laughs> I asked him if I get a ticket to heaven. <laughs> he says, you get one to hell, <laughs> easy. <laughs> As August came to an end and moved into early September, the Checker Tails undertook more fighter sweeps. These missions proved to be some of the most devastating flown by the 325th. The Axis forces faced the ferocity of seasoned pilots whose sole purpose was to cause as much disruption as possible to their adversaries. In one of these raids against the Debrecen airfield in Hungary, Checker Tails left 59 enemy aircraft burning in their revetments and bunkers as the clan turned for home. On the return flight, Lieutenants David Schmerbeck and Bruce Cobb added three JU-52s, two of them shot down by Schmerbeck, and Lieutenant Colonel Ernest Beverly downed a Messerschmitt. Once more, the Checker Tails had critically damaged the enemy's infrastructure and ability to fight. On all fronts and all theaters of war, the weather was always an issue for the fighting men and the tacticians in command. In the Mediterranean theater, many days were washed out by torrential downpours of rain, which affected the men of the 325th as well as other U.S. air bases nearby. Archive film captured some of those conditions which made airfields and their surroundings almost impassable, putting the lives of returning airmen in great jeopardy. New Year's Eve 1943 was a particularly troublesome time for members of the 325th, as gale-force winds swept across the base. 
In the wake of the receding winds, tarpaulins and canvas were left flapping in the remains of the cooking area. With the day's celebratory roast turkeys covered in dust and debris still on their spits. After an extensive search of the archives, no reports can be found that the food went to waste, and assuming it was consumed, there are no reports of the 325th suffering any ill effects. Later that year, it was reported that a tornado struck the base, narrowly missing the main area, but running the length of the revetments. Fortunately, only two of the P-51s parked nearby were damaged. However, Mother Nature once nearly ended the fledgling career of Barry Davis. He recalls a mission he flew while stationed with the Army Air Force Ferry Command shortly before being transferred to the 325th. I was very fortunate. I didn't know it at the time. I wanted to go into combat, but I didn't know this at the time. I was fortunate in being assigned to the Mediterranean Air Transport Service as a ferry pilot. And all I had to do was fly the P-39s, Ara Cobra and the P-47 Thunderbolts from where they were assembled in Casablanca or Rennes and uh, Algiers, fly them up to Italy where the combat units were. We had atrocious weather reports. I mean, they, it's like having no weather reports at all, quite frankly. And uh, when I was flying up, I didn't even know that uh, I'd heard something about the volcano blowing its top, but I didn't know anything about it. And then it was like flying into a fog that got thicker and thicker. And by the time, and it was actually all the smoke and grime and pumice and everything from that volcano I was flying through. I was, kept flying lower and lower until I found myself over the Naples Harbor flying among those barrage balloons that they uh, floated above the ships. But anyhow, I finally found a field that the, uh, that was P-39 I was flying. I found a field where the 332nd uh, fighter group was located and gave them the airplane. <laughs> that thing, the pumice and all that stuff in the uh, smoke and all from the volcano had taken all the paint off a leading edge of the, every leading edge in the airplane, tail, wings, propeller, didn't have any paint on it. And the uh, windscreen, you couldn't even see out of it. It was just it sandblasted. And uh, I turned that airplane over. The guy's name that was the group commander was Davis. It was his name, African American. And uh, I turned it over to him. He didn't say one word. He just grunted, turned his back on me, and walked off. <laughs> that airplane, I don't know what they had to do to it to get it really in shape again. Eight days after the Debrechen success, the Eka airfield in Yugoslavia was next to feel the wrath of the 325th with a further 58 enemy aircraft destroyed. In his notes on these operations carried out by the Checker Tales, Brigadier General Struther, Commander General of the 15th Fighter Command, wrote, This is the most thoroughly effective strafing attack I have ever known. In terms of completeness and destruction accomplished, the Checker Tales did an incredible job. Gun camera footage was examined day after day, showing consistent success in bringing destruction to the enemy supply lines. In some of the footage, locomotives were seen being strafed relentlessly. Rolling stock was hit hard, and resulting explosions showed that the contents were not merely food or building supplies. Enemy vehicles were attacked along with anything else that could be of use to the enemy infrastructure. The main targets on these missions were the areas of Nice, Belgrade, Budapest, and Vienna. Aerial targets were also being racked up by the Checker Tail pilots, and Lieutenant Arthur Fiedler scored two more victories with a Ju-52 and an HE-111 falling to the accuracy of his gunnery skills. At this time, a change of leadership came as command of the 325th was handed over to Lieutenant Colonel Ernest H. Beverly from the outgoing group commander, Lieutenant Colonel Chet Sluter. Beverly was to be a popular leader and a perfect choice to watch over such a high-profile group of pilots. Although the pilots faced flak and enemy aircraft on a daily basis, not all aircraft were lost to Axis efforts. 
Lieutenant Harold Kick was lucky to survive when his aircraft was struck by a strong crosswind gust while taking off. Unable to take avoiding action, his Mustang careened into a bulldozer that had been parked nearby. The resulting collision forced the nose of his aircraft into the ground, and Kick found himself trapped upside down in the canopy of his aircraft, which was filling with gasoline from the steadily leaking fuselage tank. Fortunately, ground crews raced to the scene and managed to drag him free, saving him from the horrible death of drowning in the aviation fuel. Sadly, one event in Lucina is recalled by two of the pilots who witnessed it. A young and talented pilot, Flight Officer Don Terry, was taking part in training for a new tactic in which P-51s would carry bombs under the fuselage. As Terry reached the correct altitude in his aircraft, Bad Penny 4, they could only watch in horror as a series of events unfolded that no one could have predicted. Uh. Yeah, we were going. To, that's right. We were going to get a mission where we were going to have to do some dive bombing. So I had two flights, uh, and I had them go down near near the ocean there, and there was a river ran into the ocean, and we told them to to uh, practice on that bridge, and we were going to watch, you know, to see how it went. And one of them, uh, one of them. For some reason, when he pulled out the wing, his wing broke off and flipped back over and hit the cockpit, hit the tail off and went in. And uh, we didn't do the dive bombing after that for some reason, but that, that did happen. We lost the plane. The wing actually folded up. We were practicing. They told us we were going to have to start dive bombing, and the P-51 wasn't. It was not a dive bombing airplane. It was so clean, it picked up speed too fast. And we would, uh, we were a little different from what they were in Korea, where they had the P-51s there. They used them there for dive bombing. But we'd roll over above 3,000 feet, but not above 5,000, above 3,000 to stay above the small arms fire. 5,000, we were picking up too much speed by the time we released our bomb. But in this case, the best pilot that I ever knew, young 19-year-old, came in our outfit, and uh, he rolled over into his dive. It was beautiful. We were sitting on a bridge. It was a simulated dive, dive bombing, because they didn't have any bombs on there, no, nothing like that. So we were watching them, sort of grading the dives as they came down. When he pulled out, his left landing gear came down in the slipstream. He pulled out with so many G's, it pulled his left landing gear out and uh, threw the airplane sideways and the air hitting it that way, it just came all to pieces. I mean, literally, uh, just disintegrated. And I don't know if they'd ever found out what caused his crash if we hadn't been there watching the thing. We were sitting on a Jeep looking at it and saw exactly what happened. Well, immediately they put the word out. Evidently they hadn't had it before. And the uh, North American designed locks, mechanical locks that held the gear up. One of the more diverse escort missions flown by the Checker Tails found pilots at high altitude protecting a variety of photo reconnaissance aircraft from P-38s to Spitfires. It was during one of these missions that Lieutenant Harold Kick of the 318th Fighter Squadron observed the newest weapon in the Luftwaffe's armory, and one that hadn't been encountered before by the Checker Tails. While on that mission, and deep into enemy territory, he saw what could only be an aircraft far below him. Just seconds later, and trailing a stream of thick black smoke, the aircraft raced past him and tried some shots at the P-38. Fortunately, it was unsuccessful, and it dove away into the distance. Kick gave chase and raced after the aircraft, but could gain no ground on it and had to break off to continue his escort duty. The Checker Tails had for the first time come face to face with the Luftwaffe's new rocket-fueled Messerschmitt 163, and lived to tell the tale. Throughout October, 
The enemy was reluctant to appear in the skies that Checker Tales patrolled, but November brought more of a challenge to the clan. On November 5th, while returning from an escort mission of B-17s to their target at the Floresdorf oil refineries in Vienna, Captain Aki Rao Jr. of the 318th saw his flight leader desperately trying to shake three enemy aircraft, all of which were jostling for their chance to fire at him. Rao dipped the nose of his Mustang and plummeted into the heart of the battle. Within seconds, a ball of flame engulfed one of the enemy planes as Rao's machine guns raked across the underbelly of the enemy. Rao worked into position and brought his guns to bear on the second of the aircraft. This time, bullets ripped through the portside wing route, tearing it off, causing the aircraft to spiral wildly out of control, plunging earthward. The third bandit, on seeing his colleagues disappear around him, broke away and headed into the low clouds to cover his escape. Thinking his battle was over, Rao pulled alongside his flight leader, only to hear through the headset that his original wingman was in serious trouble from a 109. Turning sharply, he saw the fight below him, and once more dropped into a perfect firing position. With a squeeze of the trigger, the 109 ripped apart before him, scattering debris all around his plane, leaving his wingman safe to fight another day. Rao's professionalism and ability had that day saved two other pilots' lives. He was rewarded with a DFC for his superb display of marksmanship and teamwork. Over the previous months, the Luftwaffe had improved upon the rocket-powered single-engine ME-163 and were now ready to launch a new twin-engine jet fighter in a bid to stem the air superiority of the Allies. The Messerschmitt 262 came into service late in the war for Germany, but they still hoped it could swing the balance of attrition in the air to their favor. The new plane carried a deadly set of 30mm cannons, which would easily tear the wing off an Allied bomber and easily destroy a fighter plane. This was of immediate concern to Allied commanders because the rate of climb and maximum ceiling of the 262 could easily threaten the high-altitude photo reconnaissance missions which were regularly flown by P-38s and P-51s. On the 2nd of December, Lieutenant Billy Hinton and his wingman, while escorting a P-38 on one such mission over North Augsburg in Germany, became the first of the 325th pilots to encounter the new threat. Bursting through the clouds below, a 262 surged upwards and fired at the P-38, which was hit, but relatively unscathed, and continued flying. Just as fast as it appeared, the 262 vanished, then reappeared, coming toward them in a head-on attack. This time, Hinton got his shots off first. When gun camera film was examined later, Multiple hits were seen to strike home against the 262 before it broke off the attack and once more vanished from view. From that point on, the mission continued as originally planned without further incident. It had been a close call, but now the pilots realized firsthand how serious a threat the 262 could be. It was also the only true excitement the Checker Tales faced in the following three months. Missions continued as before, with bomber escort missions making the majority of their workload, while photo recon missions filled the gaps in between. The pilots of the clan, feeling frustrated at the lack of air action, carried out fighter sweeps with ruthless efficiency. Every time the pilots came back to base, their armorers set about reloading the guns, as they always found targets to hit. Each day saw the destruction of supply lines, enemy vehicles, airfields, locomotives, rolling stock, and ammunition dumps. It appeared that the Axis forces were having difficulty bringing experienced pilots to the battlefront, making most of the missions flown effectively milk runs. We had a, a mission fighter suite down over Greece, and Art was leading we were leading the two rear flights in the squadron. The squadron's a box formation, two flights in front, two behind, and uh, flying down across, we'd just gotten over Greece, and we could go after anything at that time. 
Well, I saw Art drop his tanks and start down. So I said, uh-oh, Art had wonderful eyesight. He sees something. So I dropped my tanks and start down with my group too, right behind him, close behind him as I can get. Well, he comes down and there were two, there were three transports, so JU-52s, those three engine German transports I had that were on final approach to an airfield. And he had seen them, I had them. Well, he comes in, he gets one of them. I think he got two of them, but somebody else put on a flame also, so Mark shared it with him. But anyhow, I got down there, said, oh heck, they've got the transport. They shot him down. So I went across the airfield. And I set three of the planes on fire going across that airfield. And Art said he, he thought I shot, I uh, set five of them on fire. By that time, he was behind me. I pulled up any aircraft just going off everywhere. It was like the 4th of July, they were all shooting at me. Climbed the hill, and then I realized I'm going slower all the time. 170, 165, 160. What in the world? Well. I had forgotten to change from those external tanks to the internal tank, and my engine hadn't run from the time that I had been up at 20,000 feet. And uh, it was a good sound to me when I changed the uh, fuel selector valve to an internal tank and flew over that hill and away. By March 9th, the Checker Tail Clan were dominating the air they patrolled. Bomber crews described how they looked with the distinctive rudder markings of the 325th and how spirits and morale would rise as the little friends, sporting the large yellow and black squares, pulled into protective formation to escort them deep into enemy skies. Axis pilots would often make a quick snap attack at the bombers, then break off after seeing the checker tails. Sometimes these snap attacks would be effective, and then it was up to the checker tails to make sure that the bomber got home safely. I used to make a point of trying to find B-24s that were hanging back in trouble. And uh, I joined up with this guy one day, and he came out over the island, and he said, listen, we're not gonna cross the sea here. I said, go on, I'm gonna stay with you all the way. He said, no, we don't, we're not gonna make it. I'm gonna bail my crew out here. He said, there's 10 of us on board, so count them. So I couldn't talk them out of that, so they all bailed out, and then the plane turned, and I counted 10 shoots, and the plane turned and headed back over Yugoslavia. I said, gee, that, that guy's liable to land. i save an airplane that they can use, you know. So I shot him down. Boy, what a, you should have seen that thing go off when it hit the tent near the town. It was like the end of the world going up. But they put out an order later, no more shooting bombers down. <laughs> On March the 2nd, Colonel Ernest Beverly ended his tour of duty and handed over command of the fighter group to Colonel Felix L. Vidal. The shift of leadership coincided with the 325th heading for a new base at Rimini, where they arrived on March 5th. This base found huge favor with the war-weary pilots. The base and runway were situated in a flat, open landscape, which gave extra operational benefits, as any bomber returning damage from a mission would be able to make an emergency landing. Having spent long months in hard bunks and unkempt tents, the personnel arrived to be greeted by a five-story hotel, which had been abandoned earlier they readily set about making themselves at home. With a pierced steel planking runway only a few yards away, this really was a luxury HQ that many hoped would be a long-term location for the group. With every move the group made to a new location, the ground crew and pilots took the opportunity to add further touches to the checker tail markings that had been adopted in July of 1943. The initial markings, designed by Bob Basler and John Watkins, had only been painted on the fin, rudder, and elevator of the P-40s they flew. With the transition to P-47s, the nose of the aircraft saw various designs being tested, including a swept black red blaze on 318th P-47s, while the 319th 
had a narrow vertical band of yellow around the nose of the aircraft. Many of the Thunderbolts were also painted with personal markings, usually with the pilot's artwork on the port side and the ground crew's artwork on the starboard. With the move to Lucina and the transition to P-51s, this legacy continued, and many of the aircraft could be seen being painted with a variety of artwork on days when missions were not undertaken. Also, the 15th Air Force then required that a yellow band be added near the wing root and a yellow band near the wing tip. With the move to Rimini approaching, some P-51s were given an extended makeover in paintwork, and soon, the newly adorned Mustangs could be seen sporting not only checkers on the tail surfaces, but now extended along the fuselage to the point just behind the star and bar insignia. While not an official policy, some pilots had an outline in red or yellow added to their fuselage number. Further enhancements included checkers on the long-range fuel tanks, undercarriage struts, and wingtips. It seemed that the pilots and ground crews of the clan had decided that the Axis and Allied forces should be fully aware of who was flying the aircraft in their proximity. From their new base on March 14th, pilots of the 318th Fighter Squadron flew escort duty with B-24s of the 55th Bomber Wing heading to the Nova Zamke Marshalling Yards in Hungary. Leading the squadron was Lieutenant Gordon McDaniel of Sweetwater, Tennessee, in his Mustang painted with the unit's number 40 and personalized with the name Mary Mac after his wife's name Mary and a pun on the first ironclad ship of the American Civil War, the Mary Mac. His wingman that day was Robert Cletus Burns flying number 63, Jan's Little Joe, a change from his usual aircraft named It's a Dog. As the mission progressed deep into enemy territory, a layer of overcast formed below. Lieutenant Richard Deakins of McDaniel's flight reported over the radio that he was having difficulty with his oxygen supply and would have to abort and return to base. With permission given, Deakins dropped out of formation through the clouds and made his turn for home, when he became aware of four aircraft in his proximity, which he immediately identified as Folkwolf 190s, and reported back to his leader. In a radio interview recorded shortly afterwards, McDaniel takes up the events as they unfolded before him. There really wasn't much to it. There we were, cruise loft about 20,000 feet. We just begun to let down. And I happened to look over the side and there far below me I spotted several planes. They were traveling west and we were headed east. We were in an area where anything had happened. Over the radio, I told the rest of the men to hold their fire until we positively identified the planes below us. You see, I thought they might be Russian planes. I certainly didn't want to get the fight if they were. So we dropped in behind them. They never knew we were there. They were flying a pretty sloppy formation, sort of strung out in a long and even line. I closed up behind the last plane, about 150 feet from me. And there was no doubt about it, they were Jerry planes. The guy directed ahead of me had a big white three and a black cross on the side of his plane. Well, that's enough for me. Over the radio, I told the rest of the men to drop their tanks and get ready to hit them. Then I opened fire on the Jerry nearest me. He just blew up, almost in my face. I ducked my head as parts of his plane scattered around the ship. He never knew what hit him. I opened fire on the next one. One wing and part of his tail fell off and he spun out of sight. Then the three remaining German planes started to dive toward the earth. I still don't believe they knew we were there behind them. I rode down on the tail, firing at the third German. His canopy popped off and I saw him jump and I don't even think he had a parachute. I started firing at the fourth German. He blossomed with flame and started to smoke and burn. When he went into a spin, I concentrated on the fifth one. I'm sure he knew he was after him. He dropped down about 100 feet above the deck. He started to skid around a little trying to evade me, but it was no use. I hit him. My wee men saw him spin in and burn. It was then I discovered that there was only two of us against the five Germans. You see, two of my planes had to drop out of the fight because of trouble. That's all there was to it. Gordon McDaniel had completed one of the rarest of achievements. He became an ace in one day. His wingman, Robert Burns, was now called into action as a sixth 190 appeared and McDaniel positioned to cover his wingman. Low on the deck, Burns moved into firing range 
and after a short battle for tactical advantage, Burns got hits into the 190 and watched as it barreled into the ground and exploded. The final victory count for the 325th that day was tallied with evidence from pilots and gun camera film showing that the Checkertail clan had accounted for a total of 18 aircraft. As the air war continued, the Allied forces on the ground were reaping the benefits of the 15th Air Force Offensive. Along with the destruction of aircraft, the attacks against the road and rail networks had caused major disruption to the enemy supply routes, and the Axis forces were finding it almost impossible to defend their front lines. This allowed the Allies to move with momentum, cutting through previously occupied territory. The recaptured land often included air bases, further depleting the enemy's ability to defend the skies. As the Allied assault gathered pace, airmen who had been captured and made prisoners of war were being moved further away from the advancing forces. But the advance eventually led to prisoner of war John Gonda and Stalag Luft III being liberated by the forces of General Patton. John continues his story. After we were at Mooksburg for a while, then the Russians started to move south, and uh, and they were approaching our uh, Mooksburg, and from Mooksburg, they took us out one night at midnight and put us on a march down to Nuremberg. We were there for a short while, and then we were on, a, on another march further south. We knew the Americans were coming across Germany and uh, we just sort of waiting and hoping they would expected to be liberated. And we eventually were by uh, General Patton came in through the camp, into the camp, and he liberated us and we were taken down to an airfield. From, uh, from that airfield, we ended up at, uh, in France, La Harve, I think it was. And uh, we waited for a uh, vessel, an ocean-going vessel, to take us uh, over across the sea to the USA. The war had steadily taken its toll on the Axis pilots. Fewer enemy planes were being encountered, and it became apparent that the pilots lacked experience. Many of the veteran enemy pilots had eventually succumbed to be replaced by groups of new, young pilots whose lack of experience eventually became their downfall. Whenever there was a skirmish, the experienced checker tails would come away unscathed, with multiple victories to recount as they arrived back at base. While these battles were becoming fewer, the 325th pilots made the most of their time carrying on fighter sweeps, opening up new paths for the ground forces. With a lack of aerial opposition, the checker tails penetrated deep into the pockets of enemy resistance. On April the 2nd, the checker tail clan moved base for the last time during its active service of World War II. Although the pilots had enjoyed their stay at Rimini, the luxury of hotel accommodation was all too brief. On April the 2nd, the 325th transferred a short distance to Mondolfo, on the edge of the Adriatic Sea. This would be the last change of operational station during the group's active combat service of World War II. Allied commanders considered that the move was imperative to keep pressing home the attack on the retreating Axis forces. The airfield at Mondolfo had two 4,000-foot-long parallel runways with two adjacent taxiways. Large areas of pierced steel planking had also been laid down, giving a capacity of approximately 200 aircraft. A blister-type hangar, a control tower, and a rudimentary tent containment area northwest of the operational airfield was also constructed. It was perfectly situated for the checker tails to make their fighter sweeps against the enemy targets, and virtually unopposed, the pilots set about this task. 
During these missions, the occasional group of enemy fighters was encountered, but there seemed to be no willingness to stay in dogfight once the full force of the checker tails came to do battle. This changed slightly on the 18th of the month, when Major Ralph Johnson, commanding officer of the 319th, and his wingman Ray Woodstock took part in a fighter sweep low over the industrial areas of Munich and Regensburg, where they were set upon by an ME-262. Ray Woodstock takes up the events as they saw the twin-engine jet take off from the airbase below, followed shortly after by another. When I talked to uh, my uh, commander on that flight when I was at 7,000 feet, and I said, look down there at Regensburg, there's airplane taking off, and that's when he told the rest of the people to stay up there, and then we, the two of us, split S from 7,000 feet and went down. When we crossed that field, of course, the plane that I had saw taking off was already off, but luckily there was a second one taken off. He turned to the right as he was climbing up, and he was trying to get altitude, and he was climbing to the right, and because I was on the right wing of my squadron commander, Ralph Johnson, uh, it put me directly in line with him so that my 650 calibers could go off and I could see him hitting his airplane as he was trying to climb up to get a little altitude. And that's when that he, he popped that, I can still picture it, how he popped that canopy off. And then I saw immediately after the canopy off where he came out and I saw him where he, his parachute had not opened yet. It was trailing behind him and I was going to hit him. Actually, my airplane was going to hit him. I had to wheel rapidly a wing to the left and miss him. And then his parachute opened up after I went past him. My, uh, I didn't see him land, but Ralph Johnson, the person I was flying with, said, oh, he landed on the ground all right. His parachute opened up after it went past me. So I can I can visualize that. I can see it right now as I'm talking about it, what happened there. And uh, it was quite a sight. We didn't know when we went down. I didn't know initially that that was going to – I didn't even know what a T ME 262 was at that time. It was just an enemy airplane over Regensburg that was taken off of the airfield. The checker tail clan had at last accounted for one of the Luftwaffe's most prized and elusive possessions after finally adding a jet engine fighter to its scoreboard. The following days saw more fighter sweeps, and by the end of April, the checker tails had left a trail of destruction in their wake, with locomotives and rolling stock taking the brunt of their punishment, the total destroyed now reaching into the hundreds. As the final days of April drew to an end, Mustangs flying their 315th mission became the last to lock horns in combat with enemy fighters. This brief encounter took place while escorting B-25s of the 340th Bomber Group to the Ora Diversion Bridge in northern Italy. The enemy aircraft approached at a terrific pace, but shortly after, the Luftwaffe were minus six of their number without a single loss to the 325th and all bombers accounted for. The mission was completed without further incident and all returned to base a few hours later, with only a couple having taken flak damage. The final mission, flown by the Checker Tail Clan during the war, was Mission 342 on May the 7th, 1945. In comparison to the action they had faced in the preceding months and years, it really was a simple milk run. The aircraft to be escorted that day were Halifax bombers of the Royal Air Force with the objective to drop supplies in open country, which to everyone's relief passed without any problems. This was to be the last time the Checker Tail Clan would fly as an active unit in World War II. Gordon McDaniel, flying back on that mission, recalled seeing people running about the base and made the assumption that somewhere there must be an enemy fighter attacking. Scanning the skies, looking for anything that could be suspicious, his radio suddenly burst into life. Over the headset came news that many had hoped for, but none had dared to expect. The war was over. Germany 
had unconditionally surrendered. Steadily, one by one, the North American Mustangs touched down and taxied to the revetments, where, for the final time during their combat tour in World War II, the Mustangs' engines fell silent. With a total of 567 missions in P-40s, P-47s, and P-51s, the Checker Tail Clan had flown 18,212 sorties, accounting for 70,772 hours of combat flying time. In those hours, they had committed themselves with a focused fury against the enemy forces throughout the Mediterranean theater and other Axis-held countries. When added up, the final destruction toll wrought by the 325th fighter pilots against the Axis forces read 534 aerial victories, with 52 more claimed as probable. 281 aircraft destroyed on the ground in strafing attacks. 264 locomotives permanently disabled, with a further 137 claimed as probable. Also accounted for were 148 rail cars, of which the majority were tank cars. In open country, the fighter pilots had also managed to seek out and destroy a further 159 motor vehicles, with another 106 listed as probable. Along with this official tally, there would be the unquantifiable cost of damage and destruction caused in fighter sweeps against ammunition dumps, enemy shipping, and oil supply lines. The 325th Fighter Group ended the war with 27 fighter aces, who in total accounted for 201 enemy aircraft between them. The fighter group also had the second highest scoring fighter ace in the Mediterranean theater, with the formidable fighting skills of Major Herschel Green, who had a victory count of 18 enemy aircraft to his name. This eventually led to the recognition of the 325th as the highest scoring fighter group in its area of operations. In October 1945, pilots, ground crew, and staff of the 325th returned to the United States, where on the 28th of the month at Camp Kilmer in New Jersey, the final curtain drew to a close on the fighter group as the order to deactivate their unit was given. The Checker Tail Clan had finally come home. In the years since the final days of World War II, the members of the Checker Tail Clan made a pact to hold an annual reunion for as long as veterans or families survived. In 1946, the first of these was held in Providence, Rhode Island. Over the years, the reunions have been held at locations across the United States, with many nostalgic stories and memories shared between those gathered there. The name and reputation of the Checker Tail Clan was never forgotten. Its legacy has now continued. On July 1st, 1981, the 325th Fighter Weapons Wing was activated at Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida. The wing enriched its heritage by adopting the emblem, awards, and history of the 325th Fighter Group of World War II fame. The men and women who serve with the 325th Fighter Wing carry the Checker Tail's name with honor and pride, providing air sovereignty, supporting homeland defense against all threats, as did the men of the Checker Tail Clan in World War II in the skies of the Mediterranean. In 2010, veterans and families gathered at the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C to lay a wreath in honor of those who have passed during and since the end of the Second World War. In 2012, they gathered in California. Once more stories were shared and old acquaintances rekindled. The veterans were honored at the Camarillo Air Show with a flyby tribute and met with many visitors to share their stories and tell their history. In 2013, Veterans and families will make the trip to Boston, Massachusetts for the 68th reunion. 
Now is the time to meet the surviving members of the Checker Tail Clan. Our history defines us. They defined history. Uh, this was the first time I had ever been in a formation of more than eight airplanes. And when we started, originally we took off, we all took off with uh, 16 airplanes and two spares in each squadron. So that was 54 airplanes. And I, I tell you what, I think I had my mouth, oh, <laughs> really agog at seeing all those airplanes and flying such excellent formation. I see all these dots in the skies up there. And I think it's these airplanes. And I yell, bogeys, two o'clock high. Well, for a second, two seconds, there wasn't any comments on the radio. And then the most sarcastic voice I ever heard in my life said, that's flat. Well, I had never seen flak before. They were dots in the skies, and I was sure that they were airplanes, but they weren't. So when we came back and we had to uh, debrief in intelligence, I proudly tell the three airplanes I see. Uh, anyway, when, when I reported the three, I was pretty proud of the fact that I had seen these three, three birds. And the rest of the people, I couldn't believe it. They, they saw anywhere from 35 to 40 enemy airplanes and I never saw them at all. And it was then that I realized that I had a lot to learn about being in combat. Uh, that was a, uh, a fitting end to my first mission, I'll tell you that. I remember though that uh, we, we had a B-26 bomber old war weary thing there at one time and they flew that thing down to Africa and bought a whole lot of cherries. We were going to have cherry pie. The mess steward cooked all these pies up, put the first slice out there for uh, for Herky. Herky took a big bite, bit down and almost broke a tooth. The mess steward failed to take the pits out of the cherries. But uh, that's when there was action because that night at supper time the mess steward didn't have any stripes on his arm. Herky had busted him down to private. Uh, it was great. I mean, we had a pot belly stove was in there, and we used to have the uh, uh, 65 drop tanks, gallon drop tanks that we'd 100 octane fuel, and we'd run a line out the bottom of it, and it'd be aluminum, and then you'd put a rubber hose in it, about uh, that much, and then a copper tube the rest of the way into the uh, uh, bottom of your stove. And one of the things, one time we went in there, and I turned it on and threw a match down in there and I thought it lit and I was laying over there in my sack and Tom Goodwin come in and he says, uh, the damn stove isn't lit. And he starts, he lights the match and I started to say, Tom, the damn gas. And he lit the match and threw it <laughs> down in the stove. Kind of stove go, boom! <laughs> blew, the, blew the roof off our tent so we had to, <laughs> had to repair it. And then Tom was so pissed at me, he couldn't see straight because he burned his eyebrows, his eyelashes off of him. But he didn't give me a chance to tell him that there was gas in the bottom of the damn thing, you know. He was quite a guy. He had a typical New York accent. And uh, we were walking along one time. This is a true story. And uh, Hank said, look at the Boyd. I says, Hank, that's not a Boyd, that's a bird. He says, it chirps like a Boyd. <laughs> After our missions, we'd all get together and uh, have a debriefing. Anybody having any trouble with the airplane, the engine, anything like that, that's when you bring it up, any maintenance problems, anything of that kind. And uh, they asked if anybody had any problems. Hank said, my Earl coolers wouldn't work right. Now, squadron, I mean, our group commander, Chet Fluter, says, you're what? Hank says, my Earl coolers wouldn't work right. Chet Sluther says, I don't have anything like that on my airplane. I came back on an airplane uh, from doing a briefing in, in the, the Pentagon, and this guy uh, was talking to me, and uh, he found out I was a checker tail pilot in World War II. And he says, well, you don't look black to me. And I said, why, well, I'm not black. And he said, uh, 
well, the, the checker tails were the black pilots. And I said, no, they weren't. The black pilots were the red tails. I said, we were the checker tails. And he said, my father told me that the black pilots had checker tails. And I'm saying, look, I was in the outfit. I fought over there. I ought to know. He looked at me and he said, I'm, I'm about uh, 50 years old, 52 years old, maybe. And he says, well, you're getting kind of old. You probably don't remember. And I, I tell you what, we never talked for the rest of the flight over. We had one interesting thing one day. Uh, George Hamilton and I were flying with some other guy. And uh, we had what we called Plan Baker. And this one day we were flying up close to Yugoslavia, a little north of Yugoslavia, where the break in the land is there. And George said, hey, my engine just quit. And he couldn't get it started. He kept trying to get it started. It wouldn't start. I said, come on, Plan Baker, George. And I pointed him back to this German airfield, the north end of Yugoslavia. And the, the other wingman knew what to do. And there were only three of us. So what, the thing to do is you fly down there, and you fly right on his wing. And the other guy flies over here. And when you get close to the ground, the other guy comes in and strafes alongside the runway keep their heads down, and you two land close together and get to the end. You turn around, throw your shoot out, he jumps off and jumps in on your lap and then take off. We got so close to where I was almost on the ground. When he got his, his he flew away. I said, where are you going, George? He's like, I just started. And that was the end of that. I said, gee, George, you just killed a big deal. <laughs> I guess it's about number five or six mission. I, we were up and I, I have no idea where in the hell we were. And of course, they hollered break and the squadron goes one way and uh, Tom Beatty goes the other way. And uh, I didn't see another, didn't see another American airplane. And uh, this guy, I finally realized he was a German. I started pulling up on him and the like. And I had him, well, I'd hear about shooting out of range. And so I, got in there and his wings were hanging outside the gun sight and I thought, well, I'd better get a little bit closer. And so I got in to where his wings were hanging out of the canopy and I reached up, well, well I had my hand in the stick, I pulled the trigger and I didn't have my gun switches on. And Christ, I went flying by that guy and he kind of hosed me a couple of times and I made a turn and spiraled and went down and he didn't follow me, thank God. And uh, I came home and that was an uneventful, <laughs> uneventful mission. <laughs> was our group commander, 31 years old. We thought he was too old to fly combat. And for some reason, even though he was a uh, group commander and led the group on missions, he got in very few fights. So he put the word out, if anybody saw a bogey anywhere in the sky, they would let him know first because he wanted first chance at it. But one day we got in a real Donnybrook. It was a great fight, if you can call him that. And uh, Chet Sluder was on the tail of a ME-109, all set to blast it out of the sky. And he looked behind him, and instead of seeing his wee man behind him protecting his tail, he saw another ME-109 back there getting ready to clobber him. So he broke away to save himself. He escaped all that, but missed shooting down the airplane he wanted. When he got back home, he hunted up his wee man and said, where were you? The wee man says, Colonel says, I looked around, I saw so many of those German airplanes that I knew we were outnumbered, this down a chance, so I came home. Do you know, uh, Colonel Sluter was so dumbfuzzled that he never did a thing about that. He didn't even make a, no comment. It was about that time, I suppose, somebody asked me, uh, do you want to go to Cairo for a little vacation? And, uh, I turned down Cairo because I was engaged uh, to a girl back home. And you know, 2020 hindsight being what it is, I should have gone to Cairo. <laughs>